Hello, welcome to the CARE TA Center Cafecito conversation with Dr. Wayne Lindstrom. My name is Dr. Eliana Ramirez. I am the director of the Crisis and Recovery Enhancement TA Center. We are funded by the Mental Health Services Administration uh, for crisis continuum of care and justice diversion in the state of California. We are having a brief conversation with Wayne about mobile crisis units. We know that in the age of social distancing with the pandemic, many of us are missing the opportunity to run into a colleague in the, next to the proverbial water cooler or in the break room. And that's typically where we would have a little cup of coffee and share information with one another that can really make a difference in the work that we do in crisis continuum of care and justice diversion. So the purpose for these cafecitos are to have brief conversations with experts in the field that we will be sharing via social media and our website with the field. So our conversation today with Wayne is about the mobile crisis units because we know that this is a hot topic across the state of California and in fact across states throughout the United States. We see many counties who are interested in increasing mobile crisis units as a way to address mental health crises in the community. And as we'll hear from Wayne, there are many different types of units that are available, uh, models, and that research is starting to tell us about different outcomes uh, with these various models. So I'm going to start by inviting Wayne to introduce himself to tell us a little bit about his background professionally and his uh, agency, RI International. Thank you so much, Eliana. Good to uh, be with you. Um, when she says introduce myself a little bit, uh, that's what I'm going to have to do because this marks the uh, 50th year of my career in behavioral health, and I certainly don't want to bore you with that long trajectory, uh, if you will. I'm uh, currently the VP for Business Development and Consulting for RI International, which is headquartered in you know, Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, we are well known as the uh, thought leaders around the crisis care continuum and the implementation of the Crisis Now model. And if you've never referred to uh, SAMHSA's Behavioral Health Crisis uh, Care Guidelines, uh, which were um, issued last year, I would strongly encourage you to use that as a reference document for any aspect of um, delivering uh, behavioral health crisis services. Wayne, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I have been singing on high, as it were, about the behavioral health guidelines. Um, since reading it myself, um, it was just published in 2020. So if folks in the audience haven't read it yet, no stress and, and no shame in that. It is just hot off the presses. Um, I found it to be especially helpful, Wayne, because it was taking a systemic approach to thinking about crisis continuum of care, thinking about um, when we can improve our systems, we have better health outcomes for clients, as well as better outcomes financially for the state. And I was really impressed with um, the clarity of vision about the involvement of peer specialists, for example, um, in the crisis continuum of care, and the very critical role that mobile crisis units can play in helping to provide mental health services in a way that um, are in people's community in their home, we see that people have better uh, responses to those crises where they're able to self-regulate in a way that doesn't oftentimes happen in an emergency room or in a jail cell. My gosh, of course, these are environments that tend to be pretty activating and stressful. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the distinct role that mobile crisis units can play in providing community-based crisis care. Well, the build on uh, what you just had to say, uh, the Crisis Now model has three core components. And the first is a state or regional, uh, what we call a care traffic control center um, that is technology enabled and can dispatch uh, mobile crisis teams. Um, so mobile crisis teams, the second component of the Crisis Now model and facility-based crisis services are the third. And we could spend more than the time we have here available today to talk at length about any one of those components. Um, but for me, the most exciting development uh, around mobile crisis teams 
uh, was a de designation last July uh, by the Federal Communications Commission to designate 988 as uh, comparable to 911. The intent here, and something we've never had in behavioral health, is to create a behavioral health care crisis system that is on par with the 911 uh, medical emergency response system. And so with the designation of 988 and then uh, a, con a congressional act uh, back in October to give states the authority uh, to implement 988 um, to in enact a surcharge on uh, cell phone call users uh, to fund not only 988 um, suicide prevention hotline numbers that are meant to also be a mental health crisis response, but also to finance just 98, not only 988 implementation, but also the crisis care continuum. So we have an opportunity uh, between now and July of 2022, which is less than a year and a half away, uh, to one, pass in enabling uh, statutes uh, for all of this to happen and have a financing mechanism for the first time, really, uh, to finance uh, these various components in the Crisis Now model. And in California, on January 16th, uh, your state legislature introduced AB 270, um, which is modeled after uh, some national model legislation that was originally uh, proposed by the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. I'm the former president of that organization. Um, and so I would encourage um, everyone who's uh, partaking of this program today uh, to reference AB 270 because you'll have the details on uh, if should it pass, what this will look like in the state of California. I'm so excited that you brought up this good news and, and who isn't open for some good news in 2020, 2021, right? This is a really major game changer that we're talking about. I remember you mentioning recently the critical juncture in time that happened when 911 was created, that prior to 911, and I, I'm seeing our time thing here, so thank you very much for that, um, Ayanna, that what, can you tell us a little bit about before 911 and after 911? What a difference it made for emergency in the community? Well, absolutely. And I, I'm old enough to remember um, when I was a youngster, there was no 911. There was no emergency medical response. You'd be lucky to get a law enforcement patrol car that was a station wagon with a gurney in the back that, that might uh, triage you in, in some way without any EMS uh, system existing and without emergency departments, quite frankly, what was akin to emergency department oftentimes was relegated to some old space in the basement. So, um, so in those days, nobody knew necessarily who to call when there was an emergency because police had a separate number, um, the fire department did, uh, the hospital did, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, this has been decades in the making for us to have this robust emergency medical response. And instead, on our side of the fence, we've relegated this uh, too often to law enforcement uh, to intervene. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, it, it, it functions to uh, re-traumatize oftentimes individuals who have a long history of trauma already. I really appreciate you sharing that on that kind of um, immediate level. For myself as a licensed clinical social worker, having worked for many years with folks in the community, when somebody has a mental health crisis, maybe it's suicidality, they're having thoughts or they've made plans or they've actually already taken steps to end their lives. As a clinician, I'm sitting there going, okay, how do I help this person? And too often, um, the option that many of us think is available is only 911. So we call 911 and what happens? If we're lucky, um, there is a response to it. And oftentimes that response will be a police officer who will arrive at the scene. 
And I, for example, worked with veterans for many, many years. When a police officer arrives at the scene and they have weapons, that can oftentimes increase people's stress rather than help them to calm down. And we know that from the parasympathetic nervous system, when we are in a fight or flight mode, when we are in a moment of crisis, in order for us to think through the steps necessary to get to a different place, we need to be calmer. If when we're super activated, we can't make uh, good problem solving uh, skills uh, put into place. And so what we want instead is to send folks to that person who's in crisis who can help them to calm down. And so having a mobile crisis unit team, for example, show up who have a psychologist, a social worker, peer specialist, somebody who actually has lived experience having gone through mental health crises, those folks can often help to de-escalate the situation in a way that frankly, our police force is not trained to do. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the various models of mobile crisis units that are out there and what research tells us about the models that are both the most effective in terms of addressing mental health crises and the most cost-effective from a state perspective. Well, they're typically, um, uh, three variations on uh, three basic models. The crisis now model uh, utilizes a clinician paired with a peer, a person with lived experience. We have an expression in our eye, uh, peers first and peers last. Um, and we employ more peers in the 10 states where we operate um, than just about any other organization other than the, the VA uh, here in this country. And um, nobody is better at de-escalating a situation, quite frankly, than a peer. And by virtue of having a clinician, um, you can get the, um, the safety risk assessment uh, done competently, et cetera. But it's also for safety for the mobile dispatch team by virtue of having two folks there. And one can be attending to um, bystanders is, and someone else is attending to the person in crisis or uh, making appropriate um, uh, continuity of care kinds of contacts, et cetera. Um, in AB 270, um, all three models will be available if this passes. Um, so one is the mobile crisis team with um, a clinician and a peer. Another is embedding um, clinicians into an EMS response unit. And the third is a co-responder model involving a clinician and a law enforcement officer. And those are typically the most common and there are variations on those uh, as well. Um, the reality is, is we not only have the effects that you were talking about and having law enforcement uh, present, uh, but equipping and training a law enforcement officer is extremely expensive. And if you talk about the vehicle and the computers and, and everything else, et cetera. So if you're really looking for a cost-effective response, the peer clinician model is certainly the least expensive and everything would indicate that it's just as efficacious, if not more so than the other models. Thank you so much for describing that. I know, as I mentioned, many counties across the state are thinking about expanding their existing mobile crisis unit or creating a new mobile crisis unit. And there is, of course, quite a bit of discussion happening in the state and across the nation about how we can stop using the police force as a de facto mobile crisis unit and as first responders to nonviolent mental health emergencies. Um, and we know for different communities, the risk is not just that people could end up being sent to a place where they're not receiving the most useful help to de-escalate a situation, but that they could actually end up incarcerated. And of course, as been shown in the media, there's also been quite a few uh, police involved shootings as well. And when a family member or a clinician calls for emergency help when um, somebody is in a mental health crisis, the last thing that we imagine is that the situation could escalate 
to a, a matter of life and death. And so we don't want to put our police officers in the position to have to do things that um, are really, frankly, beyond um, what they've been trained to do and what their um, abilities are vis-a-vis -vis the amount of work that they're having to do already. And like you say, they are um, dealing with systems that are already stressed to the max. And so we want to make sure that we are creating a response that is a win-win for everyone and that speaks to our strengths for everyone. And when we call a mobile crisis unit, if there is a, a safety emergency that requires police involvement, mobile crisis units, to my knowledge, will call for police backup if they need it. But this way, we're able to keep police available for the crime fighting needs that the community has, rather than responding to a mental health emergency that might be better suited uh, to be responded to by mental health clinicians themselves. I wonder if you might talk for just a moment, um, some of the TA requests that we've received, and by the way, to the audience, if you have questions that you would like to have um, fielded by any of our five partnering agencies in the Care TA Center, and we also have a cadre of TA specialists in the, in the wings waiting to take your questions, um, please do go to our website and submit a request on our TA page. We will. Um, below the links to this uh, film. We will also share all of those resources that we've been talking about, the Crisis Now model, um, the SAMHSA guidelines, and then also link to place a TA request. But should, should you be interested in doing so, I want to just not elevate that we've had many counties who have specifically asked about mobile crisis units. And one of the critical pieces that we've, um, that have come up with these TA consults is that they're we're on the precipice of a changing landscape financially in California. Uh, Wayne, could you talk a little bit about for the county who is saying, okay, should we expand right now or should we build a new mo mobile crisis unit before they get into the weeds around finances and trying to figure out where to pull monies from, do you have any um, feedback that you'd like to share with us from a national level on down to a local level? Well, I think this is a, a akin to trying to build an airplane while you're flying it. Um, so I, I would encourage folks that are currently um, instituting their own their own planning to not stop uh, because it's probably going to be on a faster track than you ever imagined. So I would not encourage you to give that up and wait till somebody else gives you uh, f further guidance along the way. The reality is 988 implementation is scheduled for less than a year and a half from now. The, the state of California has received a, a planning grant to, to plan for this implementation. And on top of that, the mental health block grant has now gotten a 5% set aside uh, designated by SAMHSA exclusively uh, for building a more robust crisis system. Um, and then you've got AB 270, et cetera. So all of these things are, are happening concurrently. And I think it behooves everyone to be aware of the developments nationally, as well as what's happening within the state of California. And as you uh, learn more, um, whether it's at the federal or state level, et cetera, how does that integrate with your local planning? And if some of the planning that you hear about doesn't seem to mesh well with where you'd like to take your local system, that you're, you're well aware of what's going on and you can do your own advocacy around what changes you'd like to see in the planning that, that's going on. So all of this is a window of opportunity that's gonna have new financing attached to it. And it's really in a fast track. And um, it's important that uh, we all be attuned and um, work on this collaboratively so that uh, come July of next year, uh, we'll have something that approaches being akin to the 911 emergency medical response system. I'm so appreciative that you bring this up. And as a, a final point, I wonder about us locating this discussion right now to where we're at in the global pandemic. And in particular, I'm thinking for two reasons. The first is that there are many reasons why uh, we might want to look for opportunities to address mental health crises outside of emergency rooms, even beyond the idea that 
emergency rooms are not necessarily places that help people to kind of calm down. Um, right now in any number of communities across the state, our emergency rooms are overwhelmed frankly with patients and we even have some overflow from ICUs uh, people who are living with COVID and being treated for COVID that are actually in the ICUs heck in other parts of hospitals as well as we've seen across the state but additionally to that on the positive side there's this CARES Act that we are waiting at any moment we might start to see some funding from the federal government and I believe you had mentioned that a part of the CARES Act as it currently exists in writing, um, the idea is that there might be some monies also that could affect mobile crisis units. Do I remember that correctly? Uh, not just mobile crisis, but um, the whole crisis care continuum. Yes. So that's, that's another potential uh, resource. And as we talk about the crisis now model, you read the SAMHSA guidelines, et cetera. I think it's critical to understand that when fully implemented, this does in fact divert from arrests, uh, from uh, detention, and from emergency uh, department utilization and inpatient hospitalization, et cetera, which results in significant system savings that can be further reinvest reinvested, if you will, in building out a system that is really responsive. And in addition to that, I'm really hopeful that it will more adequately address a lot of the behavioral health workforce issues we have. Because one thing to have the dollars to build a robust system, but if you don't have the workforce, then how does it happen? See, you are constantly singing the tune that I like to move to, Wayne. Thank you for this. I, I am so excited also that you bring up this idea of staffing and bringing it back to the point around peer specialists and this peer specialist workforce. We're also in a distinctly fabulous moment, as it were, for the state of California with SB 803 and new opportunities to expand our existing peer mental health workforce across the state. And just like you said before, I love that concept of, of starting with peers and ending with peers, that the distinct contributions I think that peer specialists can make to crisis care um, are profound. And for most of us who do not have the experience of being trained in the discipline of peer specialists, we may not be familiar actually even with the full um, types of um, distinct contributions that peer specialists can make to the crisis continuum of care. So that's just another thing to add on to the plate as well is that we're in a really exciting moment where California is going to be able to expand the, the workforce for peer specialists as well. Um, in closing here, I just want to thank you so much, Wayne, for your time and see, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience at this moment about mobile crisis units, this kind of very high level bird's eye view? Well, I, I guess a, a final piece when I talk about um, system savings is we did a study uh, two years ago looking at uh, Maricopa County, Arizona, which has roughly a four and a half million uh, population and found that we took um, about uh, 37 full-time equivalent police officer time uh, back on the street. Uh, which meant that, you know, law enforcement's primary mission has to do with public safety. It's not spending hours of onboarding time in an emergency department or uh, handling, you know, behavioral health crises uh, on the street or under a bridge or in somebody's home, et cetera. Um, so the potential, particularly in these, these dire times that we've found ourselves in uh, for the last year, et cetera, just leaves me feeling... Uh, increasingly energized and hopeful. And I think we can all use uh, ample uh, doses of, of, of hope, uh, particularly given what we're going through. I couldn't agree with you more. And I really appreciate you bringing up this idea of um, how the crisis now model can help us to maximize our system in extremely stressed moments in time for all of our healthcare facilities and emergency responders in the community. Um, recently, we did a webinar with um, 
Jamie Seller from RI International about mobile crisis units. It's entitled Mobile Crisis Units 101. And we'll also put the link here for that training if people would like to access it. Um, one of the most exciting pieces that I saw in the behavioral health guidelines from SAMHSA um, on this topic uh, is this idea that if police officers are going to transport somebody who's having a mental health crisis to, let's say, a brief psychiatric stabilization unit or to a peer respite program, that one of the best ways that we can increase the likelihood that police will bring somebody in mental health crisis to a mental health facility like that rather than to a jail is to ensure that the drop-off location is doors wide open, no one is turned away in the same way that an emergency room is. So we need the police force to know if they take that extra moment to bring somebody to a mental health unit, that the client will not be turned away and that the police officer can kind of get in and get out so they can respond to the next 5,000 things that are in the queue for them to respond to in the community. And the behavioral health guidelines, I think, have some very explicit suggestions about those kinds of um, connecting pieces between systems. So when we talk about a systemic approach to the crisis continuum of care, very concrete suggestions are in um, the, the report that we've described, as well as the presentation that Jamie Seller has provided us. Wayne, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to chat with us here today. Um, if, people want to get in touch with you, um, they can do so through RI International. We will also put a link to your website there. And um, thank you so much, sir, for the incredible leadership that you've provided in so many different areas of this work. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much.